The NBA is unique in the way that a decent amount of cities have an NBA team where it's the only game in town, that the only professional sports team in that city is an NBA team, and thus raucous crowds, loyal supporters, and a special connection between the city and the team. If there is one city that has a special connection with their NBA team that is similar to the Green Bay Packers, it might be the Sacramento Kings. It has always seemed tough to being part of the Sacramento faithful in the 80s and the early to mid 90s, but it got quite interesting for this loyal faithful heading into the new millennium. 90 Sports Nostalgia presents the Sacramento Kings in the 90s from Purvis Ellison to Must See Television. And don't forget to subscribe down below if you haven't done so already. The Kings' first season in Sacramento was for the 1985-1986 campaign, and as you can see during the 80s, Sacramento was far from stellar. Unfortunately, that lack of success would continue into the early 90s. One main reason is just being very unlucky with their draft picks. The first of these picks I'd like to mention that falls into this category is Ricky Berry. The San Jose State product put together a solid rookie season shooting 40% from three-point range, which was really good for 6'8 players back then. But on August 14, 1989, Barry was found dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound at his home and left a suicide note. Maybe brighter days would be ahead because Sacramento won the lottery and had the number one pick for the 1989 NBA draft. However, there wasn't a definite transcendent player to select first overall like a Hakeem Olajuwon, a Patrick Ewan, or a David Robinson. Sean Kemp wound up being the best player in this draft but he was a freshman out of Trinity Valley Community College and the freshmen weren't being drafted high at this time and weren't really coming out. Plus Kemp had some baggage during a short time at Kentucky. Nonetheless, the Kings selected Purvis Ellison, a 6'9 power forward from Louisville. Now I understand accomplishments and stats don't necessarily translate into NBA success, but it's worth noting that Ellison was the 1986 most outstanding player in the NCAA tournament as a freshman. That is remarkable considering players were staying three or four years in school at the time. However, according to a Sacramento Bee article by Joel Davidson, Ellison had injuries and a lack of motivation. Jerry Reynolds, who was a head coach at the time, said, We found out as other teams did that Purvis didn't love the game, he was a good guy, easy to be around, but didn't have that competitive spirit, that drive. Reynolds also said that it was not his call. According to the article, it was legendary Celtic center Bill Russell who was the Kings executive at the time, who wanted Ellison. Oddly, the Kings did not bring in Purvis for interviews and did not work him out prior to the draft. But Bill Russell was convinced that never nervous Purvis was the best player. Furthermore, Ellison was the weakest player in terms of strength of all the players who came out to the combine. Obviously, it didn't pan out. The Kings won 23 games. Dick Mata became the head coach midseason and never nervous Purvis quickly being named out of service Purvis. The Louisville standout is known for being one of the biggest busts and surprisingly Ellison was traded. First overall picks are not traded this quickly as the Kings basically got Bobby Hansen, Eric Lechner and a first round pick that turned out to be Anthony Bonner in a three-way trade with Washington and Utah. Outside of Ellison there were some interesting names on the 1989-1990 Kings roster like Ralph Sampson who was basically at the end of his career at this point, Wayman Tisdale who had his best seasons with Sacramento, and Danny Ainge who was an all-star two seasons ago but it was strange seeing him in Sacramento Kings blue. Also the Kings traded away former first round pick Kenny Smith during the midseason after only two and a half years in Sacktown as the main return was Antoine Carr. Danny Ainge was traded to Portland for basically a first round pick which wound up being Pete Chilcutt and Rodney McRae was traded to Dallas for basically two 1990 first round draft picks. As a result, for the 1990 NBA draft, Sacramento became the first NBA team to have four selections in the first round. With the seventh overall pick, the Sacramento Kings selected a highly decorated college basketball player in Lionel Simmons. In my opinion, considering where they were selecting, it wasn't a bad selection. I like Simmons' skills a lot, but unfortunately, Simmons' career declined quickly and only lasted seven seasons due to injuries. I don't understand why some may consider Simmons a bust early on, but the LaSalle product showed flashes of being a really good player. The other first round selections are Travis Mays, Joan Coswell, and the aforementioned Anthony Bonner. Simmons was rookie of the year runner up, and Mays, who could really shoot, was on the second team all rookie team. However, Wayman Tisdale only played 33 games, but Antoine Carr was a nice surprise, averaging 20 points a game. The Kings approved by two wins, but was ranked last in terms of offense. Furthermore, an amazing stat to mention, the Kings were 24-17 at home, 
who had had an NBA record worst 1 in 40 on the road. Sacramento was going to do more wheeling and dealing, as they decided to give up on Travis Mays and trade him to Atlanta for Spud Webb and a second round pick, which wound up being Lawrence Funderburk. As for Mays, his career only lasted three years after a promising rookie year because of, of course, like many Kings picks, injuries. Two games into his NBA sophomore campaign, Mays ruptured both tendons in his ankle and was really never the same. As for the 1991 NBA draft, the Kings had a third overall selection as they selected Billy Owens. Owens was an outstanding talent who was very versatile. Up to this point, the NBA hadn't seen too many 6 8 forwards who could rebound, score, dribble, and pass like the way Owens could. But Owens never played the 1991-1992 season for the Kings as he got traded to the Golden State Warriors. Now I went more in depth about this trade in my video about the Golden State Warriors in the 90s as that link is below, but here are the main points. Billy Owens was a holdout until the start of the season. Don Nelson's Warriors were stacked talent-wise on the perimeter. Nelson said he was under pressure to get bigger and improve the team. Owens seemed to be the perfect fit with his talent and skills to complement Nelson's style of playing smaller lineups and creating mismatches. As a result, the Kings acquired perhaps their best player to represent Sacktown, sending Billy Owens to the Bay for Mitch Richmond, Les Jepsen, and a second round pick which wound up being Tyus Edney. This was obviously a great deal for the Kings to acquire the Hall of Famer. And I'm not saying the Kings should have kept Owens, but I always wonder what Owens could have done for the Kings and what kind of numbers he could have put up if he remained with Sacramento. When Owens was with the Warriors, he was far from being the top option. He was not going to have the ball in his possession a lot, with players like Tim Hardaway, Chris Mullen, Chris Webber, Latrell Sprewell, and Sarunas Marshallonis. As a result, there are those who think Owens never lived up to his potential or to expectations. Richmond was outstanding, and Billy Owens, like so many other Kings draft choices in the first round, had injury problems. But the offense improved as the Kings had a solid trio in Mitch Richmond, Lionel Simmons, and Wayman Tisdale. Surprisingly, Spud Webb averaged 16 points a game, but the Kings only improved it by 4 wins. Also during the 1991-1992 season, Sacramento finally put an end to the 43-game road losing streak, which is still a record today. Enter the 1992-1993 season. Gary St. Jean would be the new head coach. The Massachusetts native came over from Golden State where he was an assistant coach. And the Kings weren't going to do a lot of wheeling and dealing and trading as they did in past seasons. With the 7th overall selection 1992 draft, Sacramento selected Walt Williams, which wasn't a bad selection and definitely not a bust. But like all players who get drafted in the first round by the Kings in this era, had injury problems. The 1992-1993 campaign had Mitch Richmond only play 45 games due to a broken thumb, but Walt Williams really put together a fine rookie season and showed a lot of promise while sporting his high socks. Lionel Simmons was solid once again as Wayman Tisdale continued to put up numbers. However, it was another 25-win season for Sacramento, but a solid foundation seemed to be laid out with young talent in Mitch Richmond, Lionel Simmons, Walt Williams, and a low post presence in Wayman Tisdale, but he was getting older. There is decent talent here, possibly just a point guard was needed to distribute the ball. For the 1993 NBA Draft, the Kings had the 7th overall pick once again, and selected the NCAA all-time assist leader in Bobby Hurley. Seemingly, there was a lot to be excited about, with Mitch Richmond and Hurley in the backcourt, Tisdale and Simmons at the forward spots, Walt Williams coming off the bench with the ability to score. However, a very unfortunate accident transpired after the team's first 19 games. According to ABC 15 Arizona, Bobby Hurley was in his SUV. When it was hit, Hurley was ejected from his vehicle and landed in a ditch over 70 feet away. Subsequently, Hurley was rushed to a hospital in critical condition. Hurley lived, but was not the same player. Entered the 1994-1995 season, and here's where things begin to change a little for the better, which included a new logo. Jeff Petrie was the new general manager coming over from Portland. Brian Grant and Michael Smith helped change the fortunes and instantly made Sacramento a tougher and better defensive team. I'd also like to note Wayman Tisdale was released during the middle of the previous season and the Kings traded for Olden Polonies, who was a tough dude in the middle. In regards to this new toughness on the Kings, I can't seem to find it, but I remember a Sports Illustrated article about these Kings and their new toughness with rejected shots and hard fouls near the rim by Brian Grant and Michael Smith. Mitch Richmond was the All-Star Game MVP this season, which really helped Richmond gain national attention, which was well-deserved. 
As for the team, at one point the Kings were 28-20 and 20 in February, which was uncharted territory for Sacktown. However, in late February and in early March, the Kings had a rough point losing 7 in a row, 10 of 11. But the Kings had a 39-42 and 42 record with one game to go and a chance to play in the postseason. That game was against the Denver Nuggets in the Mile High City as the winner would earn a trip to the playoffs as the 8th seed. Unfortunately, the Kings lost, but it was a nice season when considering the Kings history since they moved to Sacramento. And one last point to mention, this was where Lionel Simmons was basically done. His production stopped mightily during the season, but would never be the same player due to injuries. Enter the 1995-1996 season. The Kings weren't drafted in the top 10 and selected Corliss Williamson, who was the final four most outstanding player in 1994 and the SEC Player of the Year in 1994 and 1995. There was depth at the four positions with Williamson, Williams, Grant, and Smith. Sacramento rushed out to a 5-0 start. Then February hit and again, the Kings struggled during a stretch losing 11 in a row, 16 out of 17. During that stretch, surprisingly, the Kings traded Walt Williams after only three and a half seasons and Tyrone Corbin to the Heat for Kevin Gamble and Billy Owens. Yes, that Billy Owens. And even though Owens was only 26 years old at the time, he wasn't the same player that he was when he was on the Golden State Warriors. Anyways, Sacramento once again posted a 39 and 43 record, but this time they earned a berth to the playoffs. As the eighth seed, Sacramento would be going up against the top seeded Seattle Supersonics. Seattle would take game one in a best of five, but Sacktown won game two. At this point, there was probably sensationalism with the media about Sacramento possibly winning the series. That's because for the previous two seasons, these were the two seasons that Michael Jordan retired for the first time. Seattle may have been the best team in the NBA, but in both seasons, the Sonics lost in the first round. So when the Kings took game two, there were serious thoughts and stories about Seattle choking again in the early stages of the playoffs. Conversely, it was Seattle who took games 3 and 4 in the raucous Arco Arena to win the series. The Kings went backwards a bit for the 1996-1997 season, going 34 and 48, missing the playoffs by two games to the Clippers. Due to a shoulder injury, Brian Grant only played 24 games. What hurt the Kings most was a stretch near the end of the season where the Kings lost 13 of 14. During the stretch, Gary St. Jean was fired and replaced by Eddie Jordan. One draft note to make. With the Kings' first round pick in the famed 1996 NBA draft, Sacramento selected Peja Stojakovic, but would not join the Kings until the 1998-1999 season. Prior to the 1997-1998 season, Brian Grant opted out of his contract and signed with the Portland Trailblazers. Lionel Simmons retired, the Kings drafted Tariq Abdul-Wahad in the first round, then the Kings took a major step back going 27-55 and major changes transpired. Mitch Richmond had just completed his seventh season in Sacramento and was 32 years old, and the Sacramento Kings never had a record above 500. During this period, Richmond was perhaps the second best shooting guard, averaging about 23 points per game during his first 10 years in the NBA. According to a Sacktown Royalty article by Bradley Geyser, the Kings were looking to get better and younger, thus leaving the possibility of Sacramento's best player in the city's history to be dealt. Jerry Reynolds was very close to the franchise at the time and was quoted in the article saying Jeff Petrie was really pressured by the owner Jim Thomas to really shake the thing up and make something happen. Meanwhile, over on the East Coast, Chris Webber was having his issues in Washington. Reports surfaced about the talented 25-year-old having character issues, being a head case, immature, and uncoachable. Washington was looking to shop Webber and as a result, the Kings traded Mitch Richmond and Otis Thorpe to the Washington Wizards for Chris Webber. At first, Webber did not want to be in Sacramento, but afterward, the Kings signed Vlade Divac and drafted Jason Williams with the 7th overall pick and Peja Stojakovic was going to play in his first season for the Kings. From what I understand, it was Divac who was convincing Chris Webber saying basically don't worry and the team will be good. Here is the starting lineup to open the 1998-1999 season. And a couple points I want to make. Up to this point, Bill Walton and Arvidas Sabonis were regarded as the two best passing centers ever, but I think Vladi Divac was right up there with them. Chris Webber had such a soft touch near the basket, great hands, and excellent control of the ball for a power forward. He was the best passing power forward I had seen up to this point. And as for Jason Williams, I know his highlight reels are legendary with his fancy passing, but Jason Williams was an outstanding passer 
with just his regular fundamental passes by getting the ball up the court quickly, being accurate and on time with his passes on the perimeter and in the post, and had excellent zip on the ball. He knew how to set up the offense once he got past half court. And with all these elements and a new head coach with experience who could just let them play, you had this, the most exciting team in NBA history. And I know there have been better options for the 1998 draft, but I honestly believe that Jason Williams was instrumental in laying the foundation for a successful run in style with his energy and his pass first and pass happy mentality. During an NBA shortened season due to a lockout, the Kings finished with a 27-22 record. Good enough for the sixth seed, but up against the two-time defending Western Conference champs, the Utah Jazz. The Kings took a two games and one lead in the best of five series, but in game four, and in front of a vibrant and deafening Sacramento crowd, John Stockton made this shot to put the Jazz up by one with under a second left to play, which led to the Jazz winning game four. Game 5 in Utah seemed like it was going to be a blowout because the Kings were unhinged, rattled, and lost their composure at the beginning of this game. But down by 12 at the half, Sacramento stormed back, but lost in OT and lost the series in what was one of the most phenomenal 5 game series of all time. It took a while, but the Sacramento faithful finally had a team to contend in the West. It wasn't just any team, it was perhaps the most entertaining team in NBA history, the greatest show on court. The Kings were must-see television and made several appearances on NBC for the upcoming years. The roster continued to be upgraded as the Kings kept improving, but lost in the playoffs to the Lakers in 2000, 2001, and then in 2002. Much has been said about the 2002 Lakers series, in which conspiracies and questions about the series being fixed, leaving many to say the Kings should have been NBA champions. But that is for another time, but I do feel for the Kings and the city of Sacramento. It was the tough times in the late 80s and early 90s that Kings fans had to endure and continued to display phenomenal support. I'm happy that Sacramento Kings fans were witnesses to the greatest show on court and happy that this entertaining brand took place in Sacktown and not in markets that sports elitists and media ooze drool over like New York or Los Angeles. In my basketball world, I want the small markets to thrive. In my basketball world, I want the Sacramento Kings to be good. The Sacramento Kings in the 90s, from Purvis Ellison to Musty Television. And don't forget to subscribe down below if you haven't done so already.